This is Pre-Calc 7.1. Today we're going to talk about parabolas, but before we get into the actual parabolas, let's talk about the conic sections here. There are four different conic sections. Hopefully back in Algebra 2, you were introduced to these the same way we're going to introduce them this year. To this year, we're going to kick it up a notch. We're going to turn them just a little bit more. Um, but the definition of a conic section is that it's the figures formed in the, when a plane intersects a double napped cone, right cone, which basically means take the tips of each of the cones, stack them on top of each other. That is the conic sections. And the first one up is a circle. Now they're going to intercept each one of these types of cones with a plane. Now remember, a plane is like a piece of paper. It's like the board that we write on. And it reaches in all directions, infinitely far, right? And so the first one up here is, if you remember, we're talking about a right cone, and cones are formed up of like circles, yeah? So technically, if I intersect or slice a piece of the cone off horizontally, and I looked at it, it'd just be a copy of the base, just slightly larger or smaller, right? To where it was. So therefore, it's a circle. So you can see that this distance, I gotta change colors, I don't want to use blue here, that you form a circle there. Because it matches the base. Now, if someone comes along and puts their finger on the side of the plane and starts pushing down, okay, the plane will start to tip. And as the plane starts to tip, as we can see here, the circle is not a circle anymore. It starts to elongate. And so it gets a little bit longer, and that forms an ellipse. Now, I'm trying to think of where have I seen this before? And I've actually saw it just this last weekend when I was in the novelty shop at Paul Bunyan's. And People have like little tea light candle holders or cribbage boards. And you're thinking, how the heck did they get a tree that seems to only be about two inches wide, but seems to be like over a foot in length? I mean, I don't know how in nature I've ever come across a tree that, you know, looked like a disc mm -hmm. like this. It's because they don't grow that way. Trees grow in circles, generally, right? I know. Have you guys ever been in the woods? Okay. Well, what they do... Okay? What they do, guys, is that you get a tree that grows more in a cylindrical fashion. They cut the tree in a really, at a really steep angle. And what that forms is that you still get the rounded edges of the tree at the end, but you get a longer board or a longer disc. And that's how they're able to make cribbage boards that have the bark on the outsides or candle holders. Okay? So that's how it works. I think that's pretty cool. So that would be how ellipses can come in play with us here, okay? The third one is if all of a sudden now the person pushes, pushes, and it goes a little too far, and it pops out the end of the cone. So well, now what happens is that you get this thing we call a parabola, and that's what we're going to deal with today. Now remember, when we're talking about where these shapes end up being, it's as if you could see the plane intersect the cone as they have the dotted lines in them. And if the person keeps pushing, 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 all of a sudden that plane becomes vertical, it will intercept both of the cones at the same time. And this one will form two, it appears, right, parabolas. But the problem or the thing about it is that they actually don't form parabolas. The cone itself, guys, forms the outside of the parabola, or the shape of the parabola. The curved part is the um, section of the cone in between the edges. Cones, guys, are made up of straight lines. If you think about it, right? It's like a big V. 
So as the cone gets larger and larger and larger, or this parabola goes out forever, it actually takes on the shape of the cone, and the cone is a V. It are straight lines. So it's not a parabola in shape, because a parabola shape is always smooth, continuous curve, right? Mm -hmm. Cones aren't that way. Now, you guys hopefully have seen something like this before because your teacher would have had you draw this box, put your diagonals in, and then you had to connect them. You found if you remember that, those are the hyperbolas. Okay? Now, here's the really cool thing. All four of the conic sections have the same general form of the equation. And that's on the bottom there. That is ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey plus f equals 0. Hence, all general forms of equations are always set equal to 0. The caveat is that a, b, and c cannot all be equal to 0 at the same time. They can equal 0, but you still need one of them around so that you get one of these four diagrams. Because if I let a, b, and c equal 0, gone, right? Mm -hmm. Now you have dx plus ey plus f equals 0. Does anybody recognize what that form would be? Any powers? No. It's a power of 1. All power of 1 equations are straight or lines. This would be like ax plus by equals c. Uh, it's a standard form of a line. So if you let all a, b, and c equal 0 at the same time, you don't get a conic section. You get a line. <clears throat> so I think that's pretty cool. So let's go into the locus definition now. The locus definition for all of these is the fact that a locus is a set of points that fulfill a geometric property. So each one of our conic sections has a different definition that uses a set of all points. Today we're going to talk about the parabola. The parabola is the locus of points in a plane, flat surface, that are equidistant, equidistant, equal distant, from a fixed point we call the focus, and a specific line on the outside back that we call the directrix. The focus and the directrix, guys, are not actually seen on parabolas. We never had to worry about this before. You've graphed parabolas. But they all have a focus and they all have a directrix. Parabolas are symmetric about a line perpendicular to the directrix, and it goes through the focus. It's the line of symmetry, axis of symmetry. The vertex is also on the axis of symmetry, and it's where the graph crosses, or the vertex is where the graph and the axis of symmetry meet. So when we're looking at our diagram here, we have this parabola. It's in blue. Can you see that if they pick a point, random point on the curve, they have this thing inside, and inside is always the focus is inside. That distance to that point is the same distance to this dotted line on the back. That dotted line is the directrix. Heck, look at the vertex. It's way in the middle here, right there. If I move to the right, I find the focus. But exactly the same distance backwards is the directrix. There's a connection there from that focus to the directrix, or focus to the vertex and vertex to the directrix. We'll get that on the next one. And notice that this, this wait a minute, this parabola is laying down, guys. This is opening to the right. Have you guys ever done any of those yet? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Maybe you did last year. But we've always dealt with ones just opened up or down. We're moving them left and right now, too. And it's just about changing the variables around. That's it. So your line of symmetry goes through your vertex and your focus. It's going to be important that you know this. Because if I gave you some a vertex, you then now know 
if I give you a vertex and a focus, where your line of symmetry will be. You will also then be able to find a letter that we're going to come on the next slide, which is the key to all of this. Okay, so here we go. Both of these parts of this chart, left side, right side, are both parabolas. The left side opens up or opens down, the other side's right and left. What's the major difference between the two? Which one's squared when it opens up or down? It's that one right there. This one has the what? X. X. Because x squared problems do what for us? That's what you always see. y equals x squared, right? If you saw y equals x squared, you're like, it opens up. If y equals negative x squared, you said it opened down. And over here, it's a y squared problem. And if it's a y squared problem, it opens up or left and right. So I'm going to back this up just a little bit and say, because I don't like them how they just threw H and K in there right away. But if you have x squared equals 4PY, that's kind of like your standard. You're looking like your y equals x squared type problem. You guys should recognize it's an x squared problem. It opens up or down. I come over here. Now I got y squared equals 4PY. Or x, sorry. Well, 4px. Nope, not there. Wrong placement. Didn't go far enough over. Sorry. This one is y squared equals 4px. If I took away h and k, but wait a minute, h and k. You guys have seen that before. When's the last time we dealt with h and k? When we took graphs and we. Shrink, stretch, or H and K went left, right, up, or down. We translated graphs. So H and K is that translation. Do you guys remember H was always with X? Hey, look right here. X minus H again. X minus H again. That meant H always did the what? Opposite. K, on the other hand, was always by itself, right? It was always plus K. Yeah. Is that the same way now? No. 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 Doesn't K look a lot like what X is doing? Mm -hmm. So guess what? It's also going to do opposite. the opposite. So in this case, both H and K are opposite of what they see inside the equation. Now think about it. If I go back to my original ones that I wrote here in red, there's no H or K, right? It's because those are at home. And if I say at home, the vertex is probably where? Yeah, uh, zero, zero, because what's H and K? Zero, zero. So when I move left, right, up, or down, that vertex is now being moved left, right, up, or down, which means the vertex on those problems is at H, K both times. HK denotes where the vertex is. Now, also, notice that up here in our equation, we have x squared stuff first, we have the y squared stuff first over here. Y is always with the K, H is always with the X, so you have to make sure that when you're grabbing a vertex, you put them in the right places, X's and Y's. Make sense? I'm going to skip over the vertex and the directrix, but if, because if you know that a graph opens up or down, and you know where the vertex is, HK, your axis of symmetry, aka line of symmetry, must also be what, or must be what kind of line? It opens up or it opens down? It has to be a vertical line. And all vertical lines have what? X equal or Y equal? Y equal. X equal. And since it's vertical, because your tick marks go up and down. Oh, that's right. So since it has to be vertical, and it has to go through the vertex, or the vertex has to be on there, hence, 
x equals h. It's x equals the x value of your vertex. And if it opens left, right, it means it's a horizontal line. That means it's a y equals, in this case, y equals the y value or k value. Y equals k is your horizontal line of symmetry when it opens left, right. The other two, I don't like that they automatically say plus p or minus p. I'd rather think of it this way. I've already told you guys that the focus is always inside the graph. So if I vertex, if it opens up, is down here, to get to the focus, I have to go up. I have to add to it. If it opens down, I need to subtract to get to it. What does p come into all of this? p is the key. If p is positive, the graph will open up. If p is negative, the graph will open down. But p is also the distance to the focus and to the directrix from the vertex. Hence, that's why they're adding it, sorry, down here, k plus p. Well, think about this. If your vertex, focus, and all that has to be along the line of symmetry, they all share an x value, h. So therefore, if I have to go up, I'm going to change my y value. I'm going to add p. So if p was 2, I would take it and add 2 to get to there. If it's the directrix, it's on the back side. On the outside, I have to subtract 2 or p to get to there. But since that's a horizontal line, it's y equals. Hence, y equals. Okay? Same thing's going to happen if it's laying down. If p is positive, I go in the positive direction that's to the right. If p is negative, I go in the negative direction that's to the left. And since I'm going left or right this time, if p is positive, I'm going to add in the x direction. I'll subtract in the x direction to find your directrix. Same thing will happen here. I'm going to subtract my p value over that far to get to my focus if it opens to the left. Okay? Make sense? Mm -hmm. So, I want you guys to take the equation itself. I want us to identify the vertex, the focus, the axis of symmetry, and the directrix, and then make a graph. Here's the really cool thing. You guys remember back to the days we did exponential growth and decay graphs? Mm -hmm. Did I make you guys make a table? Yeah. No. no. We found an asymptote, a y-intercept, and then one extra point, and we swoop the curve in. Here, if you find those four pieces of information, I'll let you also swoop the curve in. You don't need to make a table. This is not going old school. We don't bring out our Fab Five, okay? So, I look at this, and I, I kind of go through a checklist. The first thing on my checklist is, is this an up-down or a left-right type of graph on part A? How can I tell? Up it's an up down. Why? X is the x is going to be the squared. So I'm going to write up down. Okay. At this point, I'm not circling it's opening up or it's opening down. I'm just saying it's going to be an up down problem. I move on. I'm going to find the vertex next. Vertex is the h and k, and h and k will always be the what? Uh, opposite of what it looks. So therefore, where's the vertex? Watch the order. It's not, it's four, negative three. The order is backwards in the equation, and they have to be the opposite of what they look like. Because that's the way the formula, it should be y minus h. So to be, or x, Sorry, x minus h. To stay x minus 4, 4 had to be positive. Now that I have my vertex, I'm going to skip over and tell me the line of symmetry. Because this opens up down, I'm going to have what kind of line of symmetry? 
Vertical or horizontal? Vertical. vertical. And vertical lines are? X equal. And it's going to be X equal? Four. Four. Because the line of symmetry includes the vertex, and the vertex has an X value of? Four. Or negative four. four. I am now going to find P. And if I find P, I have the key to get to the focus and to the directrix. Now, I'm going to go back up to that equation. I'm going to generically write down what the general form of it is above it. So over here, it should be x minus h squared. Yes? Mm -hmm. Equals. Now remember, those sides can be switched. Left and right can be switched sides. But it should be y minus k. And what's in front of the y minus k? 4p. No. Well, I'm just going to line things up. Could you guys agree that these two line up pretty nicely? I know H. I got it. I know K. Those line up pretty easily. So it's like I can ignore. I could ignore. That means if I want to find P, I have to set 4P equals 8. 4P equals 8. <coughs> they, they should. Like, they're not, we're not really canceling. We're saying that these pieces are equal. So I can ignore it. These pieces are equal. That means the 4P equals 8. Or 4P and 8 are also equal. And so therefore I can set it up and say, hey, P is equal to 2. two. Now, this thing, if P is positive, it opens which way now? Uh, up. It's up. Now, very generically, there's my parabola. Where's the focus going to hang out? Inside, right? So, to go inside a parabola that's opening up, I need to do what with that too? I need to add to my what? Am I changing my x direction? It's not going left or right, it's going up or down. So, I still get to keep 4, but where would I end up being if I started at negative 3 at the vertex? And went up. Negative one. I'd be at negative one. Because so I went up two. Because you did the P, you take what that P was, and you do negative three plus two. Right. And it's negative one. Your directrix is on the other side back here, right? Mm -hmm. And it has a distance of how far away? Um, From the vertex. Still is P, I and mean, P is two. So it's a y equals. If I go two down from negative three, so you do three minus two. Negative three minus oh, two. Negative three, yeah. okay. So it's at y equals negative five. You have four pieces of information now. Granted, this graph right here that we just drew doesn't count. That's not our graph. If anything, I only use that for demonstration purposes only. What I am going to do, though, is now make a graph. Start plotting some information. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. There's my vertex. I'm going to put a little V next to it. Your directrix is at negative five. There's your directrix. Put a little D next to that for directrix. Um. 4, negative 1. That was my focus. Notice that it's 2 up or 2 down. The last thing you have, oh, a line of symmetry, which goes right down the middle, yeah? If you can put all of that on a graph, the last thing I want you to do is just swoop a curve in. With the caveat that this curve will be what? Locus definition said, the distance to the curve, to the focus, and to the directrix has to be the same. So you kind of gauge this and say, okay, if I put my curve here, does that look to be the same distance to the focus as to the directrix? 
I don't think so. So I wouldn't be here. Could I be somewhere maybe there? Would that be okay? Give or take? No. I think so. So, oh, no. Are you know it's open and out? Say it again? How do you know it's open and out? Because P was positive. Since P was positive, it opens up. And so what I'll do is I'll take this point, I'll mirror it over there, and now I can draw it through the vertex in those points. Guys, this is a very crude drawing. It's not going to be perfect. But, again, if I saw this, I think we'd all agree that that inner one would not be correct. Okay? Okay. So, homework is on page 428, day 1, 6 through 11. Have a great day.